I tend to spend a lot of time online and I do frequent forums that seem to skew, uh, how do I put this politely, much younger than my own demographic. <laughs> I think that's putting it very politely. And you notice some things when you do that. I've noticed some things when I do that. And that's that uh, sometimes people get um, hypnotized by the, the current most exciting thing. And my fear is always that people are going to overpay for that excitement of owning that one hot item. Uh, and that tends to be true, I think, of a lot of the generations that are younger than my own. We were probably guilty of it, too. But what I'm talking specifically about here is novelty bullion and novelty coins. When are they a good idea? Are they ever a good idea? Uh, I think that I've seen some examples recently where... Uh, people have overpaid way, way, way far past the value of a bullion item just for the thrill of owning something that was hot and exciting for that moment. And you kind of feel like that meme of the old man shaking his fist and saying, get off my yard, uh, because you want to make sure that these kids aren't overpaying for something. But then something might happen that kind of turns you around and made you realize that, you know, maybe they're on to something. Maybe you were the one who was wrong in the first place. Novelty bullion, novelty coins. That's what this video is going to be about. The pitfalls, if there are any, and how we make those determinations between what is something that is kind of a novelty, a flash in the pan to borrow something from the, uh, the miners of California Gold Rush. Or is this really something that has legs, something that has long-term potential? It's an interesting topic, and I think that's one that we probably don't talk about awful often enough, the idea of novelty coins and novelty bullions. If you are new to the channel, my name is White Cross. You can call me Dub C. You can call me White. I answer to pretty much anything. And if you are new to the channel, I'd love to invite you to join this channel, subscribe to it, become part of this community. If you are one of my returning subscribers, what can I say, guys? Thank you, as always, for being with me here again today. If you are new to the channel, I like to begin each of my videos with a simple disclaimer. That disclaimer is that I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not trying to offer any kind of financial advice. I'm simply trying to share some of my experience, some of my observations, having bought and sold precious metals and rare coins for the last 30 or 40 years. I also like to begin each of my videos with a couple of concepts that we can kind of fold back into the subject matter. I'm going to hit you with a couple of easy concepts, but I'm going to ask you some questions too after that. I want you to think about these while we're talking about uh, some of these items that you see before you and a few others that kind of fall into that category of novelty bullion. And I want to have you kind of thinking about those questions as we uh, broach some of the topics that we're looking at here. I think this is going to be kind of an interesting journey. I'm glad you're here with me. So uh, some of the uh, topics that um, I want to talk about, the definitions, the first one is really simple. That's novelty. And novelty is the quality of being new, original, or unusual. Now, I love unusual when it comes to bullion. And I'm guilty of loving unusual when it comes to coins also. We start uh, talking about my core collection. You'll see lots of different pieces that are very unusual. That's what I'm drawn towards. So I don't think there's anything wrong with unusual. But my fear is that sometimes you overpay for the unusual. And that's kind of the, 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 um, the negative, the pitfall of this side of novelty bullion. So uh, that's really simple. The quality of being new, original, unusual. The other one is topical. Topical is something of immediate relevance, something of immediate relevance, interest, or importance owing to its relation to current events. So something that is of the moment, something that's happening right now. It's something that's easy to get caught up in. We've had lots of lottery prizes recently, some of the Mega Millions prizes and other lotteries around the United States that have gotten very close to and even surpassed a billion dollars. So that might be the kind of thing that you talk about at the water cooler at work. If you've got a work crew that you work with, you guys might be talking about this. Uh, class might be talking about it. Friends and family. But the moment that you buy that ticket and that ticket doesn't win... Uh, that ticket becomes completely obsolete. It has very little value, maybe a little bit of a loss value for your taxes if you file that way. But for the most part, you wrinkle it up and throw it away, right? It's a losing ticket. So right before the drawing, that piece of paper could be worth a billion dollars. And it's one of the most exciting things that you can hold in your hand. But as soon as that drawing is over with and those numbers didn't win... That piece of paper went from being the most important thing that you've got in your life to something that you don't even think about. It's trash. It's garbage. So that's the nature of something that is topical. It is of the moment. It's super exciting. It's super relevant. 
but then it can also uh, just disappear instantaneously. And then I had a couple of questions that I mentioned, um, and that kind of goes to the heart of what we're talking about. When is bullion, and, and bullion in this case sometimes includes coins, when are they a novelty? What makes them a novelty? Is it based on the object size or its shape or its color? Some of these are colorized. Some of them have interesting shapes, uh, you know, guitars or uh, anime characters. Is it So is it based on the shape? Is it based on the size? Is it based on the color if there's any? Is it based on the issuing country or the lack of an issuing country? And whether that country minted the piece themselves or maybe they had it farmed out to a private mint. And we've got several examples. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Is it based on the denomination or the face value? Does it even have a face value? If it does, is that a legitimate face value? Is it non-circulating legal tender? And we'll talk about those concepts a little bit later also. Maybe it's based on the percentage of the perceived value or the price of that object and its intrinsic value in its precious metal content. So if something is made out of solid gold, if it's made out of solid silver, if the object is priced close to the value of those precious metals, maybe it's not so much a novelty as something that is many, many percentages or even multiples of the value of the precious metals contained within. Just some questions I want you to be thinking about as we talk about this. So we're going to talk about several examples here. We're going to compare and contrast the countries that issued them. We're going to talk about the mints that made them. We'll talk a little bit about their prices and that kind of thing. And then we'll wrap it up with some of my observations and, and how to maybe mitigate some of these pitfalls if you decide that you want to pursue these kind of novelty, uh, topical, of-the-moment type bullion pieces that seem to come and go very quickly sometimes. So uh, the first one that I wanted to talk about are kind of what started it all off, and I'll be really brief with these because I know we've talked about them a little bit before, and that's things like these silver art bars from the early 1970s. And you're probably thinking to yourself, what does that have to do with anything? Where is that relevance? I think this is really the first time that consumers had an opportunity to buy pure silver bullion, and sometimes they were wrapped in incredibly topical subjects. You know, these came out in the early 1970s, and you'll often find pieces that make references to women's liberation or Nixon or Spiro Agnew, uh, you know, things, the oil embargo, things that were really, really important for a very brief period of time, but now they're etched in solid silver. So where these pieces still exist, and tons of them have been melted, you, it kind of makes you scratch your head and think, wow, this was something that was really important to people 40 or 50 years ago for a brief period of time. And now they've come and gone, and that that subject that they were so fascinated with means virtually nothing to us here in the 2020s. So just a couple of examples that I pulled out of my own stack. These are Thanksgiving bars because I thought it was kind of relevant here. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving 1972. So for the few months leading up to this, if this was the kind of thing that you were going to buy as a gift and give away, maybe at Thanksgiving, it had some relevance. This was kind of important if you were experiencing Thanksgiving in 1972. This was kind of a neat thing, a beautiful design, one ounce of solid silver. And these probably were purchased for just a little bit of the value over the cost of their silver. So if silver was trading for 3 or $4 an ounce back then, these probably could be had for 6 or $8 a piece. 1972, the moment that Thanksgiving was over, the moment the dishes were washed and put away and the leftovers were put in the fridge, what relevance did this have, right? What an odd thing to have commemorated in a solid silver bar. And now that silver bar is just kind of an interesting novelty, again, almost from the other perspective, because it's lost so much of that topical nature that it had. Here's one from 1973. It's kind of the same idea. So you can see these bars were often made to celebrate holidays, 1970 to 1974, 75, kind of in that area. Uh, and this one is kind of the same deal. This is a 1973 uh, silver bar commemorating the, the the first Thanksgiving. I think it's an attractive bar. It's one of the reasons why I still have it. But you can see how topical these were. The moment after Thanksgiving, they lost a lot of their relevance. They were still an ounce of pure silver, and that's a kind of a neat thing, which is why I still have them sitting here. But you can see how something that would have been in high demand right before an event happened can quickly lose its relevance, can quickly lose all of that uh, topical nature almost overnight. 
And that's my fear when it comes to a lot of these modern bullion pieces. So just something to think about. Uh, you know, the, the value of the silver is still definitely there. But if you paid a really high premium for these before Thanksgiving of 1972, and the day after Thanksgiving in, uh, Thanksgiving in 1972, it was just an ounce of silver, you probably could have put these, uh, picked these up on the secondary market for a few pennies over their silver value, and that's what we'll focus on a little bit later also. Uh, so that was the first one. The next one is something that is definitely more relevant, something that is definitely more of this era. And it was something that originally I just didn't get at all. And you uh, younger stackers are the people that got into this early on are probably laughing at me. But you have to remember, I'm looking at this through the tunnel of decades of having done this. So if you're one of the people that picked these up, uh, good for you. I think you might have made the right decision. And I'm talking about the Mandalorian Besker bars. Unfortunately, I don't have an example here to share with you, but I'll show you some pictures. The Mandalorian is a TV show, a Disney show, based on the Star Wars character, the Mandalorian. These are uh, a fighting class of warriors who wear armor that is virtually impenetrable. And I know you Star Wars geeks out there will correct me because I'm probably going to get all of this wrong. But Besker is, uh, it's not just this almost impenetrable um, element. It's also kind of used as a bullion vehicle within the series. You actually see people trading it with value. So I, I thought it was an interesting idea when I first saw it. And I did watch the first two seasons, I think, of The Mandalorian. Uh, it's been a while. I've kind of forgotten most of it. I enjoyed them at the time. I've been a Star Wars fan my entire life. I remember going to the first Star Wars back in the 1970s when I was a kid. But there's a picture of one of these bars of Besker being used in the show. So you can see kind of what it looked like in the show. These pieces, um, people that were watching the show who understood the uh, topical nature of these jumped on these and started producing kind of look-alike Besker bars made out of solid silver. And the, the ones that seemed to be the most popular were issued by a very small country called Niue, N-I-U-E, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong too, Niue. They men, uh, minted one ounce and 10 ounce versions of this bar that look really similar to the bars that were used in the series. It's kind of neat. They have almost a Damascus steel look with wavy lines going across them. Uh, very distinct looking. Uh, Niue made these in 2021. They made 10 ounce versions of these bars with a mintage of 1,000. And they had a face value of $20 in what I believe is Niuean currency. Now, if you look at Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia says that the small island country actually uses New Zealand dollars, I believe. So, what is a Niuean dollar? Mm, I don't know. That's a good question. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Uh, so the 10-ounce bar and mintage of 1,000. They also made 1-ounce bars, and those were sold, I believe, in packs of 25. Now, these are pretty small mintages, but you have to appreciate that this was seen as kind of, kind of an odd thing. What a, a strange thing to make bullion into. And here's a, a picture of one of these, as you can see, uh, with the Niuean government seal and, on, and all that kind of thing. Uh, what is Niue? Well, Niue is a really, really tiny island country in the South Pacific. Um, it's a hundred square mile dot that is 1,700 miles away from the next largest country, which would be New Zealand. So 1,700 miles away from New Zealand is still out in the middle of nowhere. I'm not trying to offend my Niuean subscribers out there. I have, you have my apologies if I'm getting any of this information wrong. Uh, but the population of Niue... 1,500. Now, we have high schools in the region that have more than 1,500 students in it, so you can see that this is a really tiny country, right? And again, they use New Zealand dollars. Uh, these coins were not made by Niue, right? The government of Niue doesn't have their own private mint, certainly doesn't have store of silver in this little island out in the middle of the Pacific. No, these were actually made by the New Zealand mint, and the New Zealand Mint is a privately owned mint. It's been around for around 50 years. And they're based in Auckland, New Zealand. So this is a company that um, uh, farms out or, or receives uh, farmed out contracts from other countries and other organizations to make specialized novelty bullion. And that's exactly what the New Zealand Mint did for the country of Niue. So we've got those questions, right? I asked those questions at the beginning of this video. 
does the the degree of novelty on these pieces depend on the country that's issuing it in the ua it, it's not even real it's a semi-autonomous country with almost no natural resources with a population smaller than a typical american high school uh and it doesn't have silver it doesn't have its own mint even and it doesn't even really circulate these new and dollars if that's what it's denominated and i believe it is and even if it was it would be non-circulating legal tender so how much um credence do you give to something that is from a country that doesn't really circulate this currency it wouldn't circulate this currency anyway it never made this currency it certainly doesn't have the silver reserves and these pieces were struck by a private mint 1700 miles away probably never saw Niue, the country, probably were shipped directly to San Francisco or, or Los Angeles or New York or somewhere else in the world as they were being distributed. So does that have any impact on the fact that these are novelty pieces? To what degree does that matter to you as a stacker? Now, I was uh, quick to kind of discount these and wave my arms shouting, stay away from these. You guys are going to pay some serious premiums for these. And then the novelty is going to wear off and you're going to be left holding the bag with these kind of weird shaped 10 ounce bars. But I'm going to eat a little crow here. And let me show you exactly why. If you're taking a look at some of these recent sales, and I'm going to show you the 10 ounce currently selling on eBay, $900. So this 10 ounce bar, you know, probably contained, you know, 10 ounces of, of silver when silver was somewhere in that $20 range. So about $200 worth of silver. I don't ex know exactly how much these were selling for originally, but I doubt it was probably a whole lot more than that. You know, maybe 50% more. That's still a pretty strong premium. But now they're selling for three or four multiples of their silver value. So was I wrong for hooting and hollering and shaking my fist and saying, stay away from these, you young kids, you're going to get burned? You know, the more I think about it, the more I realize that uh, of all the franchises in modern history, whether it's film or other, not many things have as strong a following and people more addicted to authentic canon than the Star Wars franchise, right? This is something that goes back nearly half a century now, and people have grown up generationally enjoying these, uh, these characters, these movies, these books, everything else that's about them. So it should really come as a big surprise that something like this would have a strong collector base, right? I was foolish for kind of discounting it. So not every Star Wars fan is a bullion collector. Not every bullion collector is a Star Wars fan. But there is clearly enough of that cross-collector appeal that would make these things hold some serious value. Now, they've reissued these, I believe, in 2022, 2023. So be careful if you are buying them. I can at least give you that caveat. Watch what you're buying. Make sure that you're buying these original 1,000 mintage of 2021. If this is something you own, kudos. You seem to have nailed it. They also issued one-ounce bars, and I believe the one-ounce bars came in a 25-pack. And I'll show what these 25-packs are selling for. The 10-ounce the the, the, the bar with a $20 face value. The one-ounce bars each have a $2 face value. So these are uh, currently selling for somewhere in that $1,300 range. If you want to break it down by ounce, uh, $900 for a 10 ounce bar is about $90 an ounce. That's a pretty heavy premium. The smaller bars don't seem to have quite as much of a premium, maybe somewhere around $50 an ounce. But that definitely has some potential, right? There was some legs there that I didn't see because I was focusing on the novelty of these pieces. They were a, a really quick subject that was talked about briefly in a TV show that was a spinoff. But I think that time has passed now to show that at least for a while, these pieces are going to continue to carry these pretty high premiums. So again, well done if this was something you bought. Is this a novelty? Would you classify it as a novelty? To me, it still is. But maybe sometimes people that are buying novelties are getting it right. The next one I want to talk about is similar in some ways. It also evolved from a recent movie franchise. And that franchise is the John Wick franchise. If you watch these action movies, they star Keanu Reeves as kind of a um, a, a hitman or um, some kind of an underground bad guy uh, who is part of a community that uses gold coins as their currency. And they call these gold coins continentals. Now, they go by several different names, but that's the name that most people use for them, so that's what I'm going to call them. 
So this mercenary underground exchanges these continentals in a way that is somewhat similar to currency, but it also seems to have a lot to do with the individual's uh, value, their worth in, within the community, how much these pieces of bullion are worth. And I'll show a picture of this still shot from one of the movies where you can see that this main character has a lot of these continentals. So uh, enterprising organizations decided to jump on that bandwagon and start actually issuing continentals out of precious metals. They make them out of silver and of gold. They were apparently a limited release, and they were issued by Atmex. That's the large bullion distributor, online bullion distributor. And they use some kind of interesting words. Remember in the Niyue Mandalorian Besker pieces, they have a, a set 1,000 mintage. I had a hard time finding what the mintage was going to be for these Continentals. So limited release doesn't have quite as much sway as a definite 1,000 release. Would you agree? I think they've left that open-ended. And when you have something a little bit more open-ended, it means that more people, uh, more pieces can be minted than what the demand is. And that often leads to those prices kind of being depressed quite a bit. They are non-legal tender. I don't believe that they're affiliated with a country. Now, it seemed like a bit of a stretch for those Besker bars being from Niue, but actually being minted by a private mint in New Zealand. But I don't think the John Wick pieces, these Continentals, actually have any kind of a face value associated with them at all. They're not part of a government release. Uh, and th their release seems to be a little bit in cooperation with. I think that's the verbiage that Atmex uses. Uh, they say they've partnered with Lionsgate. That's the distribution company that distributed the, the John Wick movies. So maybe not quite as a firm relationship. You can see the Besker pieces actually have the Lucasfilm trademark down at the bottom. So this is something that is definitely approved and authorized by Disney and Lucasfilm, as opposed to those John Wick pieces uh, partnered with. They are silver and gold, so I've seen both of them. The gold ones, that's a full troy ounce of gold. So if you're buying something that is exciting to you as a John Wick piece, but you're dropping more than $2,000 on it, you can see where I'm a little bit skeptical, right? Um, and that's what really concerns me about these pieces. If you're paying a really high premium for something that is a, a, from a movie that you like, what is your exit strategy going to be? Are you going to be able to find somebody else who values these as highly as you do? That's always the case with novelty bullion. Frankly, that's the case with any kind of bullion. But the more generic your pieces are, the broader the market is. That's just the way it works. You've got to find somebody who is a really a John Wick fan who can't find these on that first market, who isn't going to order it directly for Atmex before your piece can take off in value if you're able to find somebody else who wants it. So these are concerns that I have. Dropping $2,000 plus is a lot of money. How long will these be popular? I believe that the John Wick series has kind of, kind of come to a conclusion. So sometimes after th something like that happens, there's a bit of nostalgia. People who feel like they uh, missed out, that uh, fear of missing out, FOMO, and they want to go back and recapture something. But I'm not sure that that's really going to be a case. You know, Keanu Reeves is going to continue to make action movies. I believe he's already deep into making a new version of Constantine. So there's going to be something else coming along, and that's what concerns me. We've got no face value. We've got no issuing country. We don't know what the mintage is. These have a very high price point, and the subject matter is something that may start to kind of fade after it gets out of the public eye. So these are my concerns with these John Wick pieces. Again, if this is something that you feel really strongly about, I don't want to stop, step on your toes and make you uh, question what you're doing. I just have concerns, and that's what I'm trying to share with you. And now, as I say that, let me go right into something that I bought that a lot of people would probably think is just as ridiculous. But what can I say? Sometimes being a hypocrite is fun. Uh, and I'm talking about what you see here, these bright red pieces that uh, have been the focal point of this video so far. This is a 2018 Fiji $1 silver Coca-Cola bottle cap. Now, when these first came on the market back in 2018, I happened to see them online and I thought, oh my gosh, is that a silly thing to do? But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it has that cross-collector appeal. You know, I'm, obviously everybody's a fan of Coke to some degree, but this was something unusual. This is something I'd never seen before. That novelty of something new 
wasn't necessarily the same novelty of something of that moment, right? There's nothing topical about this. Coca-Cola's been around for over 100 years. But this was something I'd never seen before, a solid silver bottle cap. And let me just take a, a deeper look at it here. What was also interesting about it is that this red plastic you see on the inside of the slab, we call that a core. So you have different color cores sometimes, and NGC had never really done a lot of different cores. They have now. I mean, this was something that came out five or six years ago. But up until that point, NGC was typically in white, right? There were a few very minor exceptions. But this is a really interesting thing, and I think it's also that Coca-Cola red color. So you've got some interesting things here with this bottle cap. Look how thick that slab is. So all of these things add interest to it, but when you see the back of this piece, why not go ahead and show it, right? You see that black and white cameo. This is a really well-made, ridiculous, funny, strange thing. It's a solid silver bottle cap. Now, it's also one of the highest quality pieces that I could find when this first came on the market. It was being offered by a company called Modern Coin Mart. And I went ahead and ordered this piece, and they had the option of uh, proof 69s and proof 70s. This is a proof piece. I know, a proof bottle cap. Could it be more ridiculous? But I always try to go for the highest quality piece that I can. When I bought this back in 2018, I paid $70 for it. I figured, what did I have to lose, right? A little bit more than its silver value. This is six grams. Is this more of a coin or bullion? You know, it's a pretty small piece of bullion, but it's also 99.9% .9 pure silver. That was another thing that intrigued me. This wasn't 90% or sterling silver. This is actually a pure silver piece. So I kind of classify this as bullion, right? An interesting thing, a larger slab, that red core, the cross collector appeal. There are so many millions of Coca-Cola fans out there. I figured I didn't really have a whole lot to lose. So I dropped my $75 and waited for a few weeks for this to arrive. And when it did, I was just expecting it to be in the slab, right? I was just thinking that this would come as a Proof 70, and it's a Proof 70 Ultra Cameo, you, you can see here. Um, but it also came with the original box that these pieces were uh, it came with. So this is, believe it or not, this is the Certificate of Authenticity, and I'll just try to open this here and see if we can take a look at it. It's a really detailed in many different languages COA, that's kind of neat. This is the box these originally came in. This is a metal box. I love that pure silver legal tender. And you open up that bottle cap, and that's where the piece was originally cushioned within this box. So it's a nice metal tin that came along with it. And it all fit into this box. I thought that it was really just kind of a neat collection, right? That really adds something to it. So you've got some interesting elements. And I know I sound hypocritical to those people who are buying the John Wick pieces, but hear me out. Uh, the country that issued this is Fiji, right? Fiji is substantially larger than Niue. Fiji um, it is about 7,000 square miles total, and it's got a population of just under a million people. This piece was also not struck by Fiji, though. I don't believe Fiji has its own mint. This piece was struck by an organization in the United States called the Crown Mint. Crown Mint is based in Scottsdale, Arizona. Now, I had a little bit of trouble finding Crown Mint when I was getting ready to shoot this video when I was doing some research, and it's my understanding that they may have come into some trouble and they may not even be around anymore. If you know for certain, definitely leave a comment down below. But their website is no longer active, their Facebook page hasn't been updated in quite a while, so it's very possible that the Crown Mint that made these for the island country of Fiji is no longer in existence. Maybe that adds a little bit of interest to these pieces, right? First year of issue 2018, just like those Besker bars, they have reissued these pieces. So if this is something you want to pursue, you want to find the first year, I think that's an important thing. We obviously saw that distinction with the Besker bars. So how much is it worth? How much is it selling for, right? People are always asking me those questions. Can't I just collect what I like and not have to worry so much about the value of them? Uh, you know, it's something that I'm always tracking in my mind, the value of my pieces. You probably do likewise. Like I said, I paid $75 for it. I didn't think I had a lot to lose. And I have kept the original pieces. I shot a, a, a video recently where I kind of looked at Silverstruck. Silverstruck is another uh, YouTuber content creator who had an interesting piece that he picked up, a Johnson Matthey MTB 10 ounce round, probably from the mid 1980s. And I talked about the originality of his piece, not just the piece itself, 
but the packaging that came along with it. I talked about originality being an important factor, and I think it is really doubly important when it comes to these novelty pieces. Anybody can find this piece online in a slap, right? That's not that unusual. But did you keep the original COA? Did you keep the original metal box that has these multiple colors on it that is the, the symbol of Coca-Cola easily recognizable? Did you keep the box that that box came in? If your answer to all of that question is yes, congratulations, you are as uh, much of a stickler when it comes to retaining these original pieces as I am, or are you? Because I also kept the original outer box that the outer box that the inner box came in. And I kept the original plastic sleeve that MCM sent the coin in, and I even kept the original plastic bag that that Coca-Cola tin came in. Yes, I keep all of these pieces. And as I said in that video, you need to weigh your sanity because I know it takes a lot to keep all of these little bits and bobs together. You also have, a, have to have enough space to store these pieces. You have to have a dry, cool location to store them so they don't degrade. It can't be something that's susceptible to mold and mildew. It can't be something that's susceptible to dry rot. This gets to be complicated, and I totally get it if you're not the kind of person that likes to store all of this, especially because it does take up a lot of space, and if you're the kind of person that has to move often, ugh, that just takes up so much of your life, so I get it. But we talk about attrition a lot on this channel. That's the loss of pieces, and that includes the loss of these items that make them original. And I think that is really important for these novelty pieces, especially when it comes with so many things that were originally issued with it. That all matters. Let's take a look and see if I'm right here. So here's an example of a, a red core with all of the goodies, with all of the packaging that you see here. And again, this is about $180. Now I have to stop here, unfortunately, with a red core because there are so few examples of the red core out there from 2018. So let's switch over to the black core. The black core has a price that's very similar. So I think that this is an apples to apples comparison as much as it can be. So here's an example with the black core and all of these goodies that came along with it originally, that originality. So about the same price, about $180. Here's an example of the black core without all of the goodies, just the slab by itself. So you can see the price has gone from an asking price of 180 down to an asking price of 125. Is that worth it to you? To me, it's definitely worth it. I also just hate to throw away things like this, but you can see that there is definitely some attraction to the originality, the piece that has all of these components. That does seem to be something that the market wants. Let's take a look at a piece that is just the raw coin. So this is the piece as it was issued from Fiji, from the Crown Mint, I believe, without any kind of slabbing, and you can see that the asking price on this is $89.95. So we're talking about a $100 difference between having this piece uh, being just the raw original issued coin and the piece as it's slabbed as a proof 70 with all of the goodies included. I think that's a pretty strong indicator that that originality in terms of the original packaging can be important. But again, don't let it drive you crazy. If you can't do it, I'm not gonna come to your house and ask you what you're doing. This has to be a personal decision like everything in the world of precious metals. Uh, one or two more items that I wanted to talk about here, and this is one of the pieces that um, I showed in my 2023 year in review, some of my favorite gold things. So if you saw that video, you already recognized that. If you didn't see this video, uh, this is a 1995 Jamaica $100 gold piece featuring the life of Bob Marley, the reggae singer. So. This was a piece that back in 1995 was released just 10 or 15 years after Bob Marley's death. And at the time, it was probably seen to a large degree as a novelty piece, right? This is a gold coin featuring a rock star on it. That's kind of the definition of a novelty. But over time, I believe this piece has really shifted from being a novelty to being a legitimate collectible with a very strong base. These pieces, when they come on the market, are snapped up instantly because no other country that I can think of in the world is so closely tied to one individual. You know, you might think of India and Gandhi, or you might think of some other country and one of their former leaders. But as more time passes, I believe the bond between Jamaica and Jamaica's identity with Bob Marley has become more and more intertwined. I think that they are almost synonymous with each other. 
for the entire world to see. Anytime you think of Jamaica, you immediately think of Bob Marley. When you think of Bob Marley, you think of Jamaica. So I think that this has gone from being something that was probably originally issued as almost kind of a novelty to being something that has a lot more legitimacy. And there's that journey between the two. Maybe the Besker bars are doing that also. What do you think? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, 15.98 uh, grams of 22 karat gold. The Jamaican piece originally had a mintage of 2,000 pieces, not entirely unlike the Besker piece, right? So we know that this was issued by a legitimate country. Uh, you know, legitimate. It's not in the UA. Jamaica has a population of uh, 3 million people. Um, and it was issued by the Royal Mint in London. So it wasn't issued by a private company somewhere. This was issued by the oldest mint or one of the oldest mints in the world. The London Mint was established in 886 AD. So does that add to that legitimacy? Remember those questions that I asked at the beginning of this video? What country issued it? Was it issued by the country itself or was it issued by a private mint? If so, how legitimate is that private mint? Is it denominated? Yes, this is denominated in $100. This is issued by the government of Jamaica, and it was actually minted by the London Mint in London, one of the oldest mints in the entire world. Does that add to its legitimacy? I think it probably does to an extent. Time also seems to add uh, to this legitimacy. Again, this is from 1995, so it's been decades since this piece was issued. Interesting. What does all of this mean? Some examples of modern... Um, novelty bullion, some examples from the 1970s, examples from 1990, uh, examples from 2018, and those examples of the Besker bars and the John Wick pieces, you can see that there's kind of different levels, different push and pull. Who made it? When was it made? What is it made of? Is it uh, legal tender? Is it authorized? Is it not authorized? Before we get any deeper into that, I, I wanted to mention that those John Wick pieces, when I was researching them, I happened to come across Lionsgate's website. Lionsgate has an actual a website with a store on it, and you can buy these pieces. And I'm going to show a picture of one of them here. This is something that can be picked up on their website for a few dollars. So this is obviously not solid gold, not even solid silver. This is kind of a fantasy copy of something that doesn't even really exist in real life. But does that matter to you also. It does the fact that you can pick these up in a base metal in a collector package for 15 bucks, does that impact the value of the original, the real pieces? I gotta put that in finger quotes because these aren't real things, right? That's the issue when it comes to a fantasy piece, especially when it comes to a topical novelty. So parting thoughts about all of these pieces before it gets too long. Again, my concern is not that you collect these. If these excite you, if this is something that you really feel passionate about, I love that. I just don't wanna see you get burned by paying too high of a premium up front, only to find out that your exit strategy is gonna be hampered because they have kind of lost their uh, glitter and gleam as time goes on. Sometimes that happens, sometimes maybe it doesn't. I just want you to be aware of it. How big is the collector base? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and when we're talking about the validity of these topical pieces, how big is the collector base? You know, if this is something that you are truly passionate about, it doesn't matter to you. You care about it, and that's what it, what's important. But with those Besker bars, the population of the people that collect Star Wars memorabilia has to be in the millions, right? So if they only made a thousand of these Besker bars, chances are you've got some pretty solid support under it. Uh, John Wick, an incredibly popular franchise, but I think it's probably starting to go away now. So I think it's kind of waning. You're going to see this kind of disappear from the, the as of right now feeling of these John Wick movies. How significant is the issuing country? We talked about a Niue versus Fiji versus Jamaica, right? I think that you've got stair step in terms of size and legitimacy. Uh, how significant is the mint making the piece? We talked about a private mint in New Zealand versus the London mint, you know, one of the oldest mints in the world going back 2,000 years almost, or 1,500 years. How significant is the original packaging? Uh, it's obviously quite large here, but maybe not so much here. And in terms of something like one of these silver art bars from the 70s, they were virtually non-existent. I think that uh, your ability to handle store move, ship, all of that kind of thing can come into play. Uh, we talked about the packaging in terms of, of having it graded by a third-party grader. Are you going to have these graded? You know, those 10-ounce Niuea bars are being graded by NGC, and I'll show a picture of one of them. 
Is it worth having it graded? Does that impact the value? I think sometimes it can. 10 ounce bar being graded by NGC, who would have thought I've only pleaded with them for years to start doing that, right? Is it worth the hassle? Is it worth the struggle of the storage space, of all the originality, when all you really want is that one Batman coin from Niue? Uh, it, it's a personal decision. It really has to be your own personal choice. Again, my fear is that you overpay when these first come out, and then your exit strategy is hampered when you do come to sell, if you ever do come to sell. Understood that sometimes these pieces are so important that you have no intention of selling them. So the pitfalls, the pluses and minuses, the excitement, the topical nature of what I would call novelty bullion. Sometimes it seems like you can hit a home run with it. Sometimes you might be that last person uh, looking for a chair when the music stops, and that's the big concern. Do you own any of these pieces? Do you own comparable pieces? Let me know. Let me know which strange and unusual, especially if it's those pieces that lend more to the bullion side. Novelty coins have been around forever, but the, the, the consumer market in silver and gold bullion really seems to be catching fire right now. And I think more and more of these types of pieces are going to find their way to the market. So let me know what you have. Let me know if you own any of these Besker bars. Did you get in on the ground floor? Are you happy with what you have right now? Is there anything that's on the market you'd like to acquire but you just haven't been able to find so far? Let me know that too. If you've got questions of any of my pieces here, by all means, leave a question down below. I'll try to answer it. If you would like to see me make a movie on any kind of a movie, a video, on any other kind of topic related to these pieces, to precious metals, to rare coins, leave a comment down below and I'll see if I've got the knowledge base and the examples so we can make a video or maybe even a few videos about that subject. And uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, <laughs> remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video too, that helps in uh, YouTube's algorithm. So I'd love to have you like and subscribe as they say. And as always, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey as you go deeper into the world of coins and physical precious metals.